Good evening. Welcome to St. Procopius Abbey. My name is Abbot Austin Murphy, and I have the honor of welcoming you here tonight for this third talk in the Documents of Vatican II lecture series. And to begin, St. Benedict says we should always begin with prayer. So why don't we pray? Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Spirit, come down upon us and be with us this evening as we reflect on the mystery of the Church. Give our speaker the gift of wisdom so that his words may help us to appreciate this great mystery with great joy and wonder. Through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Besides welcoming you here on behalf of the Benedictine monks of St. Procopius Abbey, I want to do so also on behalf of our co-sponsors, Benedictine University and the Lumen Christi Institute. And uh, we are glad to have with us the Assistant to the President for Mission Integration, Dr. Alicia Cordoba Tate, and also the Executive Director of the Lumen Christi, Tom Levergood. And we thank those organizations for their help in tonight's lecture. Tonight is the third talk in the documents of Vatican II lecture series. The lecture series stems from two basic ideas or thoughts. The first is a conviction that the documents of the Second Vatican Council are a great gift, a great gift to the Church from the Holy Spirit. In a world that is changing in profound ways, the documents of Vatican II can guide the Church through these changes so that she continues to bring the light of Christ to the nations. Second, this lecture series stems from the need to know what the Council's documents themselves say. One hears much talk about Vatican II, but not many are familiar with the documents themselves. So in a small way, this lecture series aims to help remedy that situation. Tonight's talk is on the document Lumen Gentium, the Council's dogmatic constitution on the Church. We are honored to have with us for this talk Dr. John Cavadini, for this year, the talk is titled, Spousal Vision, Seeing the Church with Lumen Gentium. And just a quick introduction for a speaker. Dr. Cavadini received his BA from Wesleyan University, an MA from Marquette, and both a master's in philosophy and doctorate in philosophy from Yale University. Dr. Cavadini is a member of the theology department of the University of Notre Dame, and he was chair of that department at, the department at Notre Dame from 1997 to 2010. In that position, he helped to make the graduate program in theology at Notre Dame one of the leading programs in the nation. He also serves at Notre Dame as a director on the Institute for Church Life. Dr. Cavadini specializes in the study of the Church Fathers, especially St. Augustine of Hippo, one of his special interests is the biblical spirituality of the fathers. In these areas and others, he has published extensively and edited various collections of scholarly essays. Last and certainly not least, Dr. Cavani is a devoted husband and father of seven children. I've had the honor myself of studying under Dr. Cavadini, and I know that not only I, but also many of his colleagues and students have a profound admiration for John and the way he does theology. His theological studies truly arise from his love for the Lord Jesus Christ and also his love for, the spa for Jesus' spouse, the Church. And so I'm honored to invite Dr. Cavity to give this, this evening's talk on the mystery of the Church. Thanks very much, Abbot Austin. Friends, as Abbot Austin just got done explaining, the document Lumen Gentium is the Second Vatican Council's document on the Church, dogmatic constitution on the Church. You could argue, in some ways, that this document is the central document from Vatican II. I know some, some people would argue that it's the document on the sacred liturgy, but they're intrinsically connected. So um, I'm going to vote for Lumen Gentium. So friends, even before we look at the document, what is the Church? That's what the document is meant to, meant to explain. But I wonder what the idea or the concept of the Church is 
that kind of um, exists in the back of a lot of our minds, even as Catholics. I think having taught undergraduates for, for many years, in the back of the minds of my students anyway, if you were to ask them what the church is, I think you'd kind of get the idea that the church is a kind of association of people, which it certainly is. Ecclesia means assembly. And that the church is the kind of association of people where people have the idea to get together and to do certain cool things together. It's kind of like a club in some ways, only it's a very holy club. And what we have, what we have to do together is sing beautiful, sometimes not so beautiful, but often very beautiful <laughs> songs. Friends, that's my sense of humor. You don't have to laugh. But my students have told me that I don't have a sense of humor. So God afflicted me. I tell them back, I, I do have a sense of humor, it's just not efficacious. <laughs> See, it's not that funny. <laughs> anyway, this idea of the church as a kind of voluntary association that pretty much depends on and is constituted by the will of people to gather, gather together and to do certain holy things together, sing holy songs, hear the scriptures read, hear them commented on, celebrate a sacred meal for, which we luckily have the recipe for, and um, to encourage each other in our faith. I think that's a kind of operative idea of the church that people have in the back of their minds. You can tell sometimes that that's there. I think I even have that in the back of my mind. I call this um, sort of the club ecclesiology, where the, where the church is thought of as a kind of a club, a really special club, but something like the Elks Club, for example, where they have special costumes and special offices and they do special things together. But the identity of the club is lodged in the will of people to come together, to associate, and to do certain cool things together. It's almost, you could say, the we the people idea of the church, which I think, as Americans, we're kind of susceptible to. Just like we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, have constituted this nation, so we have the idea that in some ways the church is formed by our decision to come together. And you can kind of tell this is operative if you have a hard time explaining to your kid why they should go to Mass on Sunday. Why should I go to Mass on Sunday? I can pray just as well at home. I can entreat God at home. I can read the Scriptures at home. Two or three of us could sit together and talk about the Scriptures. It's true we can't have the Eucharist, but we can do... We can make do. You also end up having a hard time explaining to people why it is, people will often say sometimes, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And what they kind of mean by that is, I have a relationship with God or with some higher power. I am perfectly able to prosecute that on my own without any kind of formal religious association. What is the church if it isn't that? And how would you explain it to someone and make a distinction? Lumen Gentium is the document that offers the answer as to what the church is. And so, having asked that question, that's my number one point out of seven. So we can move on to the second point. According to Lumen Gentium, here's what the church is. Ready? The church is a mystery. And indeed, that's where the document begins. If you look at the little schema I gave out. Out of eight chapters, the first chapter is the mystery of the church. And I've tried to pick out passages that, that maybe you'll recognize uh, from either having read this before, but some of these passages are so famous that they have jumped out of the document and they've kind of become part of Catholic vocabulary. Maybe most famously right at the beginning, 
The Church in Christ is a sacrament, a sign and instrument that is of communion with God and of the unity of the entire human race. We're going to come back to that idea of the Church as a sacrament, but the word sacrament in Latin means mystery. And this first chapter gives us a number of images um, under which to consider the, uh, the idea of the Church as a mystery. The most prominent ones in chapter 1, I've given under A and B there, the bride, the spotless bride of the spotless Lamb, so the Church as the bride of Christ, and B, the Church as the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ. There are other images that are floated in this, cha- this first chapter, <clears throat> the field of God, the house of God, other images that I think are kind of more in a minor key. These two, the body of Christ and the bride of Christ, the spouse of Christ, are the most prominent there and are also repeated throughout the document. Those two images in particular, then, are made to carry this idea of the Church as a mystery in chapter 1. Chapter 2 goes on to introduce this idea of the people of God. And friends, I think if you were to offer a kind of free association, Vatican II, what comes next? Like, what phrase jumps to mind? I think maybe one candidate for that would be this phrase, the people of God. I think that's one of the kind of characteristic phrases that came out of the Council, and it's introduced right here in the second chapter of Lumen Gentium. You begin, I think, to get an answer to the question, why do I have to go to church on Sunday? You could say, starting here, if you look at the passage I I took out from from chapter 2, God has willed to make women and men holy and save them, not as individuals without any bond between them, but rather to make them into a people who might acknowledge him and serve him in holiness, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, who in times past were not a people, but now are the people of God. You'll recognize the first letter of Peter, chapter 2 there. It is Christ indeed who purchased it with his own blood. So, here's this image of God willing to save us, not just as individuals. So not just as people who can have a personal experience of Jesus, you could say, as our personal Savior. And then what we do at church is we kind of get together to celebrate what happened outside of church. So what happened on our own. We have a personal relationship with Jesus. That's the important moment. And what happens as church is just that we get together and kind of celebrate that. But in a sense, the church is accidental to that moment of accepting Jesus as your personal Savior and having this personal friendship with him. Lumen Gentium takes up a different point of view, saying that God wills to save us not just as individuals, but as a people with a bond established among the people, among the people. And so that's the beginning of the answer. Why can't I just worship God at home? Because God wills to extend his salvation by forming us into a people, not just separately as individuals. That's only the beginning of the answer. But that's the first step. And, and friends, I think this phrase, the people of God, was used by the Council Fathers in a way, I think, to recover a sense of the Church which was richer and which was, in a sense, much more broadly extensive than the ecclesiology that had been implicitly operative, at least up until the Second Vatican Council, 
for some of the centuries preceding the Second Vatican Council. I think that experiencing this document is a little bit generational. Um, I hate to put it that way, but I remember the church before the Second Vatican Council. Of course, there are many Catholics who, now younger Catholics, who don't remember the church before the Second Vatican Council. And I think uh, you can underestimate the gifts of the Council. For example, there are many younger Catholics who love the extraordinary rite, the Tridentine Mass. Um, I love it too. But sometimes I'd like to say, to remind these younger Catholics that they're actually experiencing the Tridentine Mass as Vatican II Catholics without actually realizing the gifts that Vatican II has given them. So the idea then of the people of God was used, I would say, to sort of extend the sense of belonging to the church in a strong way to everybody in the church. It's one whole people, it's a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a, a people characterized by the priestly, the prophetic, and the royal um, vocation of Christ. And the, the phrase people of God was used to uh, emphasize that this character as priestly, royal, and prophetic extends through the whole church, through the whole people of God, including the laity. If you read in chapter 2 on the people of God, there's an emphasis in the phrase that the whole people of God, in different ways and with different roles, offers the Eucharist. Quote, the faithful indeed, by virtue of their royal priesthood, share in the offering of the Eucharist. And so it is that both in the offering and in Holy Communion, in their separate ways, though not, of course, indiscriminately, all have their own part to play in the liturgical action. That sense that everybody at Mass is involved in a crucial way was refreshing, I think. If you were used to kind of almost watching the Mass, hearing the Mass and watching the Mass, participating by following along if you had an English translation. So the idea that in some way the Mass is offered by everyone was a kind of, I don't know how to put it, an extension of the feeling of belonging and the feeling of mission in the Church. And it's attached to this phrase, people of God. Moving on to chapter 3, the Church is hierarchical, I didn't put any quotes, I just summarized, because I'm not going to emphasize this this evening, but in a lot of ways people will talk about the Second Vatican Council as the Council, as, as the council of the Bishop. That is, the, the Council in some ways recovered the idea of the Bishop as the head of the local church and of, of the church as a communio, a communion among local churches, all of whom are in communion with the Pope. Chapter 4, the laity. I think even the idea of a chapter on the laity struck us as a little bit new, that you would actually single out the laity and talk about them. It's the special vocation of the laity to seek the kingdom of God by engaging in temporal affairs, directing them according to God's will. The apostle of the laity is a sharing in the church's saving mission. Thus all lay people, through the gifts which they have received, are at once the witnesses and the living instruments of the mission of the Church herself, according to the measure of Christ's gift. You see, there's, there's that, that sense that having developed the idea of the people of God, it's able to talk about the laity as part of that people, as sharing in the priestly, the prophetic, and the royal mission, and and having an apostolate that truly is a sharing in the Church's saving mission, instead of thinking, I think as we were kind of accustomed to, of the hierarchy as having the saving mission. And the, the, um, and the lady, not exactly along for the ride, but in, in some ways not, not thought of as fully a part of, the, of that mission. I think reflecting on the gifts of the Council. I'm a lay theologian. 
I'm not sure that that was, that, that, that was all that common before the Second Vatican Council. And then you come upon chapter 5, which is another, one of the most, I suppose, um, famous ideas of the Council, the universal call to holiness. That's another thing. Vatican II, universal call to holiness. Again, friends, the emphasis that the whole people of God is called to holiness. The Church, whose mystery is set forth by the Sacred Synod, is held as a matter of faith to be unfailingly holy. This is because Christ, the Son of God, who with the Father and the Spirit is hailed as alone holy in the Gloria, loved the Church as his bride, giving himself up for her so as to sanctify her. He joined it to himself as his body and endowed it with the gift of the Holy Spirit for the glory of God. Therefore, all in the church, whether they belong to the hierarchy or are cared for it by it, are, are called to holiness. Another passage from this chapter. It's very beautiful. I just want to read it. Accordingly, all Christians, in the conditions, duties, and circumstances of their lives, and through all these, will grow constantly in holiness if they receive all things with faith from the hand of the Heavenly Father and cooperate with the divine will, making manifest in their ordinary work the love with which God has loved the world. Friends, even as I read those words, they're still inspiring to me after all those years. The idea that we're all called to holiness, in some ways we're all called to be saints, and that this can happen in and through the faithful um, execution, you could say, of our ordinary duties in life. Passing on to chapter 6, the, uh, the council had a, had a special document on religious, but the religious are mentioned here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that either, but I, I found a quote that I th I thought was very beautiful about the religious vocation. Let religious see to it that through them the church may truly and ever more clearly show forth Christ to believers and unbelievers alike. Christ in contemplation on the mountain, or proclaiming the kingdom of God to the crowds, or healing the sick and maimed, converting sinners to a good life, or blessing children and doing good to all, always in obedience to the will of the Father who sent him. You can recognize in what the document says about religious the call of all Christians, only in a certain sense intensified and brought to a certain focal point and visibility. But always there's a bond maintained to the rest of the church. Chapter 7, the pilgrim church, the image of the people of God as a people on pilgrimage. So a people which, who have not yet received the perfection to which they're called. The idea here is that the church is always in transformation, is being transfigured, so that it more closely, ever more closely resembles its head. So this is the, the place where this idea of the eschatological orientation of the church comes in. And in chapter 7, the communion of saints, the communion of saints, the communion, uh, the bond of communion among the earthly church, those in purgatory and those in heaven is explained. Chapter 8 on Our Lady is a kind of bookend. Our Lady is present as a chapter, or the chapter on Our Lady is present as a chapter in the document of the church because Our Lady is a type of the Church, an exemplary type of the Church. As St. Ambrose taught, the second quote, the Mother of God is a type of the Church in the order of faith, charity, and perfect union with Christ. For in the mystery of the Church, which is herself rightly called Mother and Virgin, the Blessed Virgin stands out in eminent and singular fashion as exemplar both of Virgin and Mother, so that what we find in Mary as an individual we find in the church, we, we find, um, we, we, we can contemplate in the church also, the church as virgin and as mother, as begetting children by baptism 
And the idea, friends, I think, is to, is to have given two bookends. So chapter 1, the mystery of the church. Chapter 8, Our Lady, who is the exemplary type of the church. The idea being that contemplating the mystery of the church is incomplete without contemplating the mystery of Mary. And contemplating the mystery of Mary is not complete without contemplating the mystery of the church. That's just a rapid tour through the document. So you can just kind of have in front of you what's there. You can see, I think, friends, then, that this idea of the mystery of the church is prosecuted in the document, relying a lot on this phrase, people of God. And many riches for the church, I think, came out of, as I tried to point out as I've gone along, of uh, expanding on or explaining the significance of this idea of the people of God. I think there's a way in which if you exist in American culture as Americans, which we do, it's, it's hard sometimes not to hear that phrase, people of God, and hear in the background, we the people. So that if you don't, if you don't meditate on the document Lumen Gentium, if you don't watch it unfold and watch the way it uses this phrase, you can almost end up with a very attenuated uh, idea of what the phrase means without really thinking about it. Because there's so much momentum in our culture to think about a, a grouping of people, such as the church, as something which we the people make up. We the people put together. We the people elect and is reducible to the to the, is re, fully reducible to the choice to come together and associate. So that's what I referred to in the beginning as, the, as a kind of club ecclesiology that I think a lot of young people operate with. They won't say it that way, but they'll wonder why this club as opposed to other clubs? Why this grouping? There's a lot of groupings out there. What makes this one special? And if you if you have in your, in your head the idea that the church is reducible to the decision of people to come together and form a body, you're not going to have an answer to any young person who asks that question. <clears throat> so I'm suggesting that there's a way in which this very beautiful phrase that the council used to offer us so many riches, if it, if it comes unglued or unstuck from the context in which it's elaborated in the document, you end up with this caricature, which, which I call the we the people ecclesiology. I might be fixated on this because when I got married, um, we had rented a tent. We were going to have an outdoor wedding, an outdoor wedding reception. But of course, it rained that day. The whole summer was perfectly dry until that one day. And so we, my grandfather worked for the American Legion, and so we hurriedly moved the whole thing into the American Legion Hall. But in the back of the head table was the Constitution of the United States. <laughs> it was very ironic. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, was in big letters. Anyway, maybe that's why my mind goes back to the Constitution, but and I revere the Constitution myself, but it's not an ecclesiology. So what are the clues, then, that would help us maybe reconnect this idea of the people of God back to the rich texture of resonance that it, that it has in, the <clears throat> in Lumen Gentium? So we're on to, we're on to point four. Point one was, what is the church? Point two is, a mystery. Point three is, that this idea of the mystery is elaborated in Lumen Gentium under the idea of the people of God, and that despite the many riches that it brings, sometimes in the American imagination, I think it, get aligned, it gets aligned with the idea of we the people. So number four then, 
How do you begin to recover the richness so that you can see in this very phrase, people of God, is contained a mystery which is not reducible to the, the sum of our will to get together and do stuff, even very holy stuff. It's in this phrase, which I passed over, but I'm going to come back to now, in chapter 2. <clears throat> a chosen race, a royal priesthood, etc. It is Christ indeed who purchased it with his own blood. There it is. Ever hear of a club that people purchase with their blood? Well, I think there are analogies for that, actually. And even if you think about the case of our nation, people have sacrificed um, with their blood. But that doesn't necessarily constitute the nation. The nation is constituted by the decision of people to come together. And that's what forms the bond between us, that decision. The idea of Christ purchasing a people with his blood, I think is a little bit foreign to us. How, how could we... It's hard to explain it to a young person, for example. What do you mean by that? He just dished out some blood and he got a people? Um, that seems crass. I thought of an analogy, friends. Want to hear it? <laughs> you can't really say no, can you? Okay, here's, here's my best bet. Uh, to, try, tr to try to think about what this idea is, because really this is the idea of the atonement, which is something almost completely inaccessible to young people. All right, here's my analogy. Let's say there's a gang. A gang, what's a gang? A gang is an association of people which is bound together by the idea of breaking the law. And often a gang initiation means uh, some kind of serious breaking of the law. You're really in the gang when you've killed someone. Something like that. Okay, so a gang is a really dangerous thing which is defined by resisting and breaking the law. That's what binds the people in the gang together as a gang. Okay. Let's say somebody comes along and joins the gang. Someone who comes along, joins the gang, has never broken the law, and has no intention of breaking the law, ever. But the gang members kind of like him. He seems kind of cool, he's strong, whatever. Um, whatever it takes to be a gang member. He looks like he could be a great gang member. And so they accept him. And he begins to talk to them about some really wonderful things maybe they could think about doing. For example, um, he persuades them, wouldn't it be a great idea to have a, a charity event, an event for a good cause? And the gang members are thinking, this guy is so slick. That's so smart. Uh, that's a great idea. We'll have some kind of charity function. It'll be great cover for the gang. And it'll give us, like, a little bit of better reputation. It'll be good PR. And this guy actually has a lot of connections, apparently. Because as he's organizing this event, or helping them organizing it, he manages to get, well, uh, in South Bend we have the, um, who do we have? The baseball team? The Silverhawks. But in Chicago, you have the Cubs. Right? And the White Sox. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. All right, so this guy manages to get Wrigley, no, Soldier Field. How's that? So the guy, people in the gang are thinking, this guy's got connections. Look at what he can do. He's powerful. He got the whole Soldier Field for our event, and they have the event. It's a great success. People start... maybe liking the gang a little better, until the lawlessness kind of catches up with the gang. It keeps going on. Nobody had any intention of being anything other than a gang. And after a while, the police come to their headquarters to make an arrest. 
All of them are there, including the new guy. Everybody, when the police come, step back. Who's left? This guy. Yeah, he organized that event. Yeah, he got Wrigley's, I mean, uh, Soldier Field. He's the leader of the gang. Everyone steps back, and the police arrest him and execute him, who never broke the law and never intended to break, break the law. So who deserved the penalty? The members of the gang. Who, who received the penalty? The guy who never broke the law. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, he had all the connections. Like he had a direct line to somebody to get Soldier Field just like that. But guess what? He didn't use those connections to save himself. Why? Because he did join the gang. It wasn't fake. He really joined. He was a member. And he, he wasn't going to dis, he wasn't going to at the last minute say, oh, it's just a fake. I'm not really a member. I have all these connections. Sorry. See you later. Kill them. How would you feel if you were a gang member afterwards? Okay, it's only an analogy. But you'd start thinking about this guy, I guarantee you, some of you would, some of us would. Thinking, why did he do that? Where did, where did that come from? He, we're still alive because he took our penalty. Anyone who thinks that way, friends, all of a sudden, think about it, has a new bond established between them. They now have a bond in this guy's love. They now have an association in this memory of someone who took a penalty for them and is dead. Okay, it's an analogy. There's no resurrection. <laughs> I can't figure out how to do that. That's the point. It's only an analogy. Um, but that could prompt a complete change of heart. And now we're bound together in an association that we didn't give ourselves because we were breakers of the law. Original sin, get it? We were lawless. That's what defined our association. And now we're united in, a, in, a, in an association we didn't give ourselves. The bond between us is this guy's blood, you might say. In other words, it's his love, which, is, which was poured out in his willingness to accept a penalty, even death, that he didn't deserve. So what we have is a new way of saying we, right? We say we now in him and in his love and in the memory of that love. The old way of saying we was in a bond of lawlessness, breaking the law. See, friends, how you can have a bond that you didn't give yourself? Okay, that's only an analogy, but now if you take it into the... Well, it's an obvious analogy, but if you take it into um, the guy who joined the gang is Jesus Christ, right? Who accepts baptism. I'm telling you, friends, if I were the Word incarnate... I think the really last thing I would do, if you, if you forced me to think i got to do this, okay, I'll do it. But I'm not going to jump in that water. Why? Because look who's jumping in that water. Prostitutes, tax collectors, whatever. If I jump in, it looks like I'm a sinner. But I'm sinless. And I want to go around, this is me, not Jesus. I want to go around with a banner at least saying, sinless, sinless, sinless. But Jesus doesn't do that. He mixes himself up with us. And so you see, he forms a bond in his love that we could not give ourselves. That's the church. The church is a mystery because it's an association of people who are bound together in a bond that we didn't give ourselves. We're united, we have our communion in him. So that's my fourth point. The people of God, that phrase, carries a mystery 
carries the mystery of the church because the bond that God establishes among us is not one that we give ourselves, but is, but is his love. We're in communion in Christ's love, and we have a new way of saying we because of that. So when you reflect on yourself as a member of the church, you reflect first and foremost on a gift that you've been given. You've been incorporated into this body. There's that language. It all of a sudden comes back with a new meaning. Reflecting on the mystery of the church is not then in the first place reflecting on a decision that we've all made to come together and do special things together because we've all been individually saved. It's the reflection on the way in which God created a bond between us that he gave us in his blood, that is, in his love. So reflecting on one's membership in the church from the perspective of Lumen Gentium is reflecting upon a great gift in the first place. Not a decision we made, but a gift we were given. Okay, and the sixth point. What about then this image of the church as spouse or the church's bride, which, which, which you can see is not just limited to chapter 1, but is, is found throughout the document. For example, in the Universal Call to Holiness, the quote that I read refers to the, the church as the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. The images are related. They're images of intimacy. The church is the bride of Christ, and husband and wife make one flesh, so one body. But think about the image bride. That's the one I want to think about because it's the one I think which is most, which is most receded maybe from our, from our consciousness. What does it mean to say the people of God is the spouse? It's directly related to this idea of purchased by his blood. And here we can think of another image. This is an image from the Bible. And if you're going to do anything with Catholic ecclesiology, you've got to get used to thinking in images. Because the sacred text offers us not only um, indicative sentences, but it, it, propositions, if you want to use that word, but it offers us images. And the beautiful image in chapter 19 of the Gospel of John, which is hinted at in the very first chapter of Lumen Gentium, if you look at the handout, the origin and growth of the church are symbolized by the blood and water which issued from the open side of the crucified Jesus. So you can, you can picture the Gospel of John chapter 19, right? Jesus is hanging dead on the cross, and the soldier pierces his side and outflows blood and water. And the evangelist pauses over that image. He says that eyewitnesses have reported it. Uh, and he says that the scripture is fulfilled. That's the evangelist's way of saying, pay attention to the image. If you contemplate the image, you'll receive a gift. I'm sure that if you stick, the so if you stick some something into the side of someone who just died, stuff is going to come out. You don't need eyewitnesses to necessarily testify to that. And to describe it precisely as blood and water, who knows exactly what it looked like? But to describe it as blood and water is to describe what? In imagery, the two primary sacraments of the church, baptism, water, and blood, the Eucharist. So what comes forth from the side of Christ in, uh, are the sacraments of the church and, by extension, the church itself. Friends, where else in Scripture is does something come forth from the side of someone who might as well be dead? Who's asleep anyway? Well, in Genesis, right? Um, Eve comes forth from the side of the sleeping Adam. If you contemplate the image that the evangelist gives us, the blood and water coming out of the side of Christ, you are invited to recall 
the image from Genesis. And to think then that the church, the church like Eve, is the spouse or the bride of the new Adam. What is a spouse, friends? A spouse is someone who is defined by love. First and foremost, Bernard of Clairvaux says that in his homilies on the Song of Songs, but anyway, we're not going to that far down the line here. But the, the spouse is someone who is defined by love. So the church coming forth in this image from the side of Christ means what? It's the same thing as saying the people of God is purchased by the blood of Christ. Here, the image of the church is the bride whose constitution is the very complete self-gift of Christ on the cross. That's the source of the church. That gift of love. That's what's contained in the image of bride. Think about how beautiful it is, friends, if I were Jesus on the cross and had, well, here's what I'd be thinking. You know, I think I could shed some blood for some virtuous people. Like, I'm picturing in my mind John Cavadini, sorry, you know, centuries from now, somebody that it's worth shedding a little blood for, and maybe a few of his friends, uh, maybe a few of his students, Abbot Austin, but maybe, <laughs> we could um, you, you see the view of the church that's, that's in that image it's we deserve the blood of Christ somehow and Christ is shedding his blood because he can foresee all the virtue that all of us will have all the one, but actually the real Jesus doesn't do that right his blood pours out it's just generously given. It's a complete self-gift. It's offered to everyone, to all people, regardless of their age. That's why we baptize infants. Regardless, in other words, regardless of any specific human excellence. You don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to have reached the age of reason. I ask myself, have I reached the age of reason yet? Probably not. Though I have a PhD, that doesn't mean you've reached the age of reason. Um, the church is, is made from this, in this image. The church is the, church is the spouse of Christ because the church is, it, the, the, the origin of the church is from the love of Christ. The origin and growth of the church are symbolized by the blood and water which issued forth from the open side of the crucified Jesus. Friends, that's why the church is a sacrament. So back to the beginning, the last point. That's why the church is a sacrament. Because what do you encounter when you encounter the church? You encounter the love which constitutes the church. Unfailingly, you encounter the love which constitutes the church. You don't encounter the decision of a lot of people to get together and do certain things together. Because, friends, you in where would the church be then? You would have to try to say, well, Find the 12 most virtuous people that there are. Okay, that's where the church is. But the beauty of the doctrine of the church, as Lumen Gentium expounds it, is you don't have to look for the 12 most virtuous people in order to find the church. You look for the church, the visible society, which is defined by the sacraments. The sacraments mediate what? To the church, Christ's love so that the whole church is constituted by that love instead of by whatever narrow little loves we can conjure up. You can see this if you think for a minute about the people of Israel. The, the, the people of Israel are the people of God in the Old Testament. What makes them the people of God? It's nothing that they did, no virtue of theirs, 
It's God's choice, right? God's election makes them the people of God. And no matter where they go and no matter what they do, they always are the people of God. Doesn't mean that they're always virtuous. It doesn't mean that. And the Old Testament is is full of God's um, remonstrating with the people for not living up to the covenant, etc. But nothing they do can negate God's election. In encountering the people of Israel in the Old Testament, you encounter the people of God. So that's then a kind of foreshadowing of what we see in the church. Encountering the church, you encounter a body which is defined by the love of Christ. That's the bond of communion that defines the church. And so the church is a sacrament. It mediates to the world that love of Christ which binds it together. The church is not bound together by nationality, by sex, by achievement, by age, by any human qualification. It's bound together by the love of Christ. And encountering the church, you encounter that love. That's the mystery of the church. So why spousal vision? Why the title? How do you see the church, friends? You can look around. You can see a church, just as well as I can, which can be scandal-ridden, which, like the people of Israel, doesn't seem to live up to its high calling in the person of any of its members. You can start thinking, I can join another club. I can join any club. Why this club? Well, it's not a club, but mental process. What if Christ thought that way when he was on the cross? What if Christ thought, well, I'll wait. I'll wait until they're virtuous enough. Then I'll shed my blood. And then for a few people. But what Christ does is shed his blood before any of us have done anything. It's a complete self-gift. He sees the church as spouse before there is anything that would remotely justify it. How do you see the church? By acquiring the vision that Christ has, spousal vision. You see the church when you look at the church with, the eye, with your vision formed by the spousal love of Christ. How do you do that? That is the Eucharistic life, friends. If the Eucharist is the sacrifice of Christ, the complete self-giving of Christ represented at Mass, then to the extent that you participate in communion, you receive communion, you're joined to the sacrifice of Christ. The Eucharistic life is the life of acquiring spousal vision. It's learning to see the church with the spousal eyes of Christ, with the eyes of the bridegroom, with the eyes of the spouse who gave everything while we were still enemies, as St. Paul puts it, not even friends. That's how to look at the church. And in a way, Christian life is a life of a kind of continuing vision adjustment. We are the pilgrim people, after all. The people on a pilgrimage. The people whose vision, the people whose lives are not perfect, but are being transfigured by the love which binds us together. And therefore, the people whose vision is being transfigured by the very love which binds us into one people. So that, in the fullness of time, will come, that vision will will be brought to perfection, we'll see the very love of God itself in the beatific vision. So thank you.